Greetings and welcome to the BOK Financial Corporation fourth quarter 2019 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. Please note this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the conference over to your host, Chief Financial Officer Stephen Nell. Mr. Nell, you may begin. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Today, our CEO, Steve Bradshaw, will provide opening comments. Stacy Kimes, Executive Vice President of Corporate Banking, will cover our loan portfolio and credit metrics. And then I'll provide some details regarding our income statement items for the fourth quarter and provide high-level guidance for 2020. At the end of the call, we'll have Scott Grauer, Executive Vice President of Wealth Management, as well as Mark Mon, Executive Vice President and Chief Credit Officer, available for questions. PDF of the slide presentation and fourth quarter press release are available on our website at bokf.com. We refer you to the disclaimers on slide two as it pertains to any forward-looking statements we make during the call. I'll now turn the call over to Steve Bradshaw. Good morning. Thanks for joining us to discuss our fourth quarter and full year 2019 financial results. The fourth quarter concluded a second consecutive record year for BOK Financial, both from a net income and an earnings per share perspective. For the full year, net income was $501 million, up over 12% from 2018. Diluted earnings per share were $7.03 for 2019. That compares to $6.63 last year. 2019 was a broad-based earnings year with significant expansion of our fee businesses and continued strength in our specialty lending channels, while we also had accelerated growth in, core, in our core deposit franchise. Additionally, 2019 saw us achieve our business integration and financial goals for our acquisition of COBIS, which will help drive momentum in two of our most critical high growth markets going forward. Looking at the fourth quarter specifically, net income was $110.4 million, or $1.56 per diluted share, down from our record third quarter, but up 2% from the same quarter a year ago. And as a reminder, we closed on COBIS at the start of the fourth quarter of 2018, so the light quarter comparison is appropriate. Fee and commission revenue was up 12% year over year. Those seasonal slowdowns in mortgage volumes, along with slightly lower consumer service charges, left our fee and commission revenue down 4% from the previous quarter. Expense management remains prudent, though expenses did increase 3% this quarter, due to elevated severance ex expenses as we work to right-size our business units heading into 2020, coupled with our annual charitable contribution to the BOK Foundation, which provides support to many nonprofit partners in the communities that we serve. Our loan loss provision was $19 million this quarter due to some migration in our energy portfolio, and Stacy will cover that in more detail here in a moment. Turning to slide five, average loans were $22.2 billion, that's up 3% year over year, though down from last quarter due to general paydowns in energy and commercial real estate and two anticipated large year-end paydowns in our CNI portfolio. Having said that, we feel good about our pipeline opportunity in the early start here in 2020. Average deposits were up 8% from the previous year and up over 5% on a linked quarter basis. Even with the strong growth this quarter, we were able to bring overall interest-bearing deposit costs down from 1.17% in the third quarter to 1.09% in the fourth quarter. Growing deposits to fund loan growth was a significant area of emphasis for BOKF in 2019, and you can see that in our results. This focus will continue into 2020, allowing us to fund future loan growth. Assets under management or in custody were up over 2% for the quarter and more than 8% year over year. Strong sales activity coupled with favorable equity markets were really the key drivers of that expansion. And we saw an opportunity to further invest in our company at a favorable price this quarter as we bought back 280,000 BOKF shares at $81.59 per share in the open market. I'll provide additional perspective on the results at the conclusion of our remarks, but now Stacy Kimes will review the loan portfolio and credit in more detail. I'll turn the call over now to Stacy. Thanks, Steve. As you can see on slide seven, period end loans were $21.8 billion down more than 2% for the quarter. While paydowns impacted our quarter in numbers, 2019 was a growth year for BOKF from a loan perspective, up 3% on average year over year. 
Total C&I expanded nearly 3% in 2019, though paydowns in our two largest growth engines, energy and healthcare, left total C&I down 2.7% link quarter. Energy had a fantastic year in 2019, growing nearly 11%. While the segment was down $141 million for the quarter, the trends in the industry we've discussed remain true and pipelines remain full. I expect our energy growth to return to a positive level as we head into 2020. Our healthcare channel also had an exceptional 2019, growing over 8%. Though the quarter was flat, steady growth in commitment levels and our expertise in the senior housing space bodes well for another great year for healthcare in 2020. A slowdown in general CNI seems to point to increased cautiousness in the general middle market business community. Tariffs, trade disputes, and the questions that arise heading into a new election cycle seems to have caused pause for some of our clients. Future clarity around the regulatory, trade, and economic environment should help re-energize the middle market segment. Continued discipline around concentration limits in commercial real estate, coupled with late quarter paydowns, left the segment down 4.2% for the quarter. Commitment volume is still solid in the space, and we will continue to high grade through stringent customer selection as we manage the portfolio. On slide eight, you can see that credit quality overall remains good. Non-accruing loans increased 8.5 million this quarter, primarily due to 6.6 million increase in a non-accruing community development credit. Net charge-offs were 12.5 million, or 22 basis points on an annualized basis, up from 10.6 million, or 19 basis points in the previous quarter, all relatively consistent with what we've seen over the past 18 months. Potential problem loans, which are defined as performing loans that based on known information, caused management concern as the borrower's ability to continue to perform totaled $160 million at December 31st, up from $143 million at September the 30th. This increase largely comes from the energy portfolio as the capital markets environment is requiring certain customers to work through their liquidity needs. This situation may lead to additional non-accruals and some impairments. However, as we've discussed previously, our senior secured collateral position should protect us from material loss content. Based on evaluation of all credit factors, including changes in non-accruing and potential problem loans, as well as specific impairments of two shared national energy credits, which were, we are not the lead agent, the company determined that a $19 million provision for credit losses was appropriate for the fourth quarter of 2019. I'll turn the call over to Stephen now to cover the income statement in more detail. Stephen? Thanks, Stacy. As noted on slide 10, net interest income for the quarter was $270.2 million, down $8.8 million from the third quarter, as the full realization of the last two Federal Reserve interest rate cuts were felt in the quarter. Net interest margin was 2.88%, down from 3.01% the previous quarter. I provided on the slide a roll forward to highlight significant items impacting the NIM calculation. First, Accretion levels were 5.1 million less this quarter due to the lower COBIZ loan payoffs, which reduced NIM by six basis points. Second, higher loan fees in the fourth quarter improved NIM by three basis points. Third, there was a nine basis point decline in our non-interest bearing funding profile with a decrease in demand deposits and an increase in receivables from our trading activity. In addition, our earning asset yield decline excluding accretion and fees of 29 basis points was effectively offset by a 28 basis point decline in funding costs. While net interest income and margin have moved down over the past few quarters, the projected flat interest rate environment in 2020 should allow some stability going forward. On slide 11, fees and commissions were 179.4 million, an increase of 12% quarterly year over year fueled largely by strength in our brokerage and trading business. Brokerage and trading increased over 56% from the same quarter a year ago. While overall brokerage and trading was relatively flat in the quarterly comparison, growth in trading revenue was up 5.6 million, but was offset by lower customer hedging revenue and loan syndication fees. Mortgage banking revenue was down 16% from an expected seasonal slowdown. However, 2019 was a great year for the mortgage channel as the favorable rate environment allowed us to grow the business 16% compared to 2018. 
As we enter 2020, we remain confident in our origination capabilities, even in an expected flat rate environment. Fiduciary and asset management revenue was up over 3% linked quarter and year over year, as strong sales gathering activities and favorable equity markets have fueled steady growth. Other revenue was down due to the variable nature of repossessed asset revenues from certain oil and gas properties that are contained in that line item. Turning to slide 12, total operating expenses increased 9.5 million to 288.8 million. Personnel expense increased 5.8 million for the quarter. Incentive compensation increased 2.6 million link quarter due to an increase in cash-based incentive compensation primarily from the sales activity in wealth management and commercial banking. Regular compensation increased $3 million, largely due to the severance cost from a realignment of personnel for the operating environment headed into 2020. Non-personnel expense was up $3.7 million from the third quarter, largely due to our typical year-end charitable contribution to the BOKF Foundation of $2 million. The mentioned pressure on net interest revenues moved our efficiency ratio back over 60% this quarter. While a 60% or lower efficiency ratio is still our long-term goal, it will be influenced by the mix of revenue going forward. Slide 13 has our current outlook for 2020. Average security balances remain comparable to current levels as we manage to a relatively neutral interest rate risk position. Average loan growth around 3 to 4%, with lower growth in energy compared to 2019. Average deposits are expected to cover loan growth for the year. Then interest revenue is expected to remain relatively flat compared to 2019, given overall lower interest rates for the year. Stable net interest margin from the current level, with a bias toward slight improvement if the overall net interest rate environment remains flat. Fee revenues grow mid-single digits with continued growth in brokerage and trading and assets under management and wealth. Efficiency ratio slightly above 60% as fee revenues grow faster than net interest revenue. Day two CECL provision levels will provide for loan growth and will be influenced by changing economic outlooks. We are not expecting any meaningful changes in the historic loss rates during 2020 that drive our models. Tax rate, approximately 21% of pre-tax income. We will continue to provide sufficient capital for loan and balance sheet growth, a competitive dividend payment, and a modest level of opportunistic share repurchases. Capital ratios are expected to improve slightly over the course of 2020. And lastly, I want to share the updated transition impact of CECL that we expect to book on day one. After many test runs, we expect the pretext transition adjustment to range between 60 and 65 million, which is in the middle of the range we provided last quarter. We have elected to phase in the impact of CECL transition on regulatory capital over a three-year period. I'll now turn the call back over to Steve Bradshaw for closing commentary. Thanks, Stephen. 2019 was an outstanding year for the organization and one that's really a testament to the diversity of our revenue model. 2019 proved more challenging for the industry as a whole compared to 2018 as we faced some pretty significant revenue headwinds when interest rates moved lower starting in mid-year. While this pressure typically contracts the earnings potential of regional financial institutions, we saw a strong surge in revenue from our fee-based business units that perform exceedingly well when rates decline. This was no accident. We are purposefully built to perform under any economic cycle. And though we remain optimistic in our ability to continue to grow our business in 2020, the headwinds of lower rates and the economic uncertainty that is always exaggerated in a national election year may well prove challenging. However, we have always taken a long-term approach to building shareholder value, and that focus will continue to guide our decisions on how and where we invest in the company going forward. With that, we're very pleased to take your questions. Operator? Thank you. At this time, we will be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star key. 
One moment, please, while we poll for your questions. Our first question comes from the line of Ken Zerby with Morgan Stanley. Please proceed with your questions. Great, thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I wanted to start off with expenses. Uh, you know, hoping to get a little more clarity in terms of maybe a dollar amount of expenses because it looks like this quarter was certainly higher than expected, even backing out the severance and the charitable contribution. Um, and I know your guidance is that it's going to be above 60% on the efficiency ratio, but can you just provide a little more guidance in terms of like what dollar amount is the right number to be thinking about here? Well, I think when you look at uh, 2020 and the kind of revenue that we think we'll create um, in the fee businesses, I think that's one of the reasons I feel like the efficiency ratio is going to be a little higher than 60 is because our fee business revenue growth is going to be more than our net interest income growth. And when you have fee uh, revenue growth, it comes with a little bit higher expense base, uh, commissions and other uh, activities there that just drive a little bit higher efficiency business in terms of the, the percentage. And so I think uh, a level, you know, you, you're wanting me to point to exact dollar level. I think it's, you know, out into 2020, it's going to be closer to, you know, where we are here at this one, 288.8, uh, somewhere in, you know, plus or minus in that area, I think going forward for 2020 is probably a pretty good uh, expense level to use. Yeah, and Ken, this is, this is Steve Bradshaw. One, one thing that's always uh, uh, a bit of an anomaly in fourth quarter is that, you know, that we have a number of people, not only just in the fee businesses, but also in a lot of our lending areas that have annual uh, incentive targets and it becomes, while we accrue for those throughout the year as, as we track it, it becomes more certain when you get in the fourth quarter. So we always see a little bit of lumpiness on the incentive comp side uh, as, we're, uh, as we're accruing for the year-end bonuses. So I don't, I don't uh, disagree with the way Stephen characterized that, but I do think uh, Q4 uh, always has a little bit of incremental um, incentive comp cost in it. Got it. Un understood. Um, and then two really quick questions for you. The first question is, when you see your capital ratios are going to improve, I guess whose perspective is that? I mean, they go up or they go down over the course of the year? Uh, well, I, you know, I think what we're trying to do is uh, just Im improve those ratios just modestly, okay? Um, you Meaning know, they go higher? They go higher. Okay. The, the percentages go just a little bit. You know, we're not talking about a lot of capital accumulation here. Uh, you know, I think we'll continue, as I mentioned, to, to pay a good, strong competitive dividend. We'll take advantage of the market where we can opportunistically in stock buybacks. Uh, but I, I would like to see the ratio go up just just slightly over time. Okay, perfect. And then and just the last quick question, um, how many energy credits or maybe what percentage of your energy portfolio are you not – the lead on in in the particularly in the SNCs. It's about sixty five percent of the portfolio on the SNC portfolio that we are not the agent on. And SNCs is a percentage of total. Uh, as a percent of total energy. Uh, yes. It's going to be. It's going to be a relatively high percentage. Forty nine percent. Yeah, half. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next questions come from the line of Brady Gailey of KBW. Please proceed with your questions. Hey, good morning, guys. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. When you look at the um, guidance for 2020, you say stable NIM from current level. I'm assuming yeah. that means a stable NIM from the fourth quarter level of 288. Is that the way to read that? That's correct. That's what we think. Okay, and then how? And then how? I mean, when you look at accretable yield levels, yeah, you know, the 5.8 million in the fourth quarter was the lowest level uh, you had in all of 19. I know that is a shrinking bucket, but how how do you think yield accretion will trend in 2020? You know, I think that 5.8 million was a little bit lower than I honestly expected. And I, I really think 2020 will fall somewhere in the kind of $25 million to $30 million range of accretable yield. Um, you know, I don't know how it's going to fall by quarter, 
but I think that's the level that you should probably expect. Okay. Um, and then finally, just on deposit costs, I, I know when we spoke 90 days ago, you guys were um, you know, saying deposit costs could be could be flat, if not up a little bit. You saw deposit costs down in the fourth quarter. Maybe talk about um, you know the option of continuing to reduce deposit costs from here, or do you think you know they've kind of, kind of bottomed at this 4Q level? This is Stacy. I mean, I think if you look at what we did in the fourth quarter where we increased deposits about a billion and a half, but yet reduced overall deposit costs, as you mentioned, I think that was a huge win for us in terms of continuing to move deposit costs down as we look forward. I still think you're going to find opportunity to continue to lower deposit costs. LIBOR moved immediately. Uh, as the Fed moved, deposit costs lag. They lag going up, they're going to lag going down. That gives us some opportunity as we move into 2020 to continue to improve our, our deposit costs as part of our funding, and hopefully that uh, translates into improvement in the NIM as we move into 2020 as well. Got it. Thanks, guys. Our next questions come from the line of Michael Rose with Raymond James. Please proceed with your questions. Hey guys, um, just wanted to touch on the, the loan growth outlook. Looks like three to four percent full year average to full year average. I guess I'm trying to reconcile that with the, the difference between the period end uh, balance and the, the average balance for the quarter. Looks like there might have been some pay downs uh, or some charge offs, obviously, at the end of the, at the, end of the year. Um, and, and trying to reconcile that with some of the comments around, you know, some softness around the middle market and, you know, energy not growing. Uh, as much as we we move forward. So if you can just help me square that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, we had really uh, pretty good loan growth throughout the quarter. It was really in the last couple of weeks of the quarter that we saw pay downs in both energy and commercial real estate. We've seen a nice rebound in outstanding balances early in uh, January. So we're hopeful that some of those pay downs that you saw uh, are revolving in nature and will we'll come back. If you look at where we grew last year, you know, energy grew 11%. We're clearly not forecasting energy to grow at that level as we move forward. Uh, we don't think you'll have, you, you will have some lumpiness as we've had in previous periods around quarter over quarter growth. But as you look at long term growth, being in that 3 to 4% range is something that we feel very good about. Uh, we don't think that the fourth quarter was uh, a trend in any respect. Uh, as we looked at the nature of some of those declines, there was seasonality in some of the businesses that we have on the CNI side. They tend to fund up in the middle of the year and then pay down uh, at the end of the year. Uh, energy had pay downs. We had pay downs in commercial real estate. We don't think that's really representative of what we're going to see as we move forward, and certainly that has held to be true here very early, admittedly, uh, in uh, in this new year, so I think I feel very good about the guidance that we've provided in that uh, you know three to four percent range, and uh, certainly don't see anything today that would make me think that that's not achievable. Okay, um, thanks for the color, and then maybe just switching gears uh, to energy, uh, maybe for Mark. Um, you know, where where c can you just give some greater color on you know maybe what caused some of these these issues for these two. Uh, energy snicks. I, I assume it probably has to do with the companies running out of uh, running out of cash. Um, if you can just give some color there, and, and whether they were gas related or oil related, and then has anything changed as it relates to your thoughts around energy lending? You know, as we move forward as an asset class. Thanks. Well, first on the uh, taking energy as a class, uh, what's, nothing's really changed on how we're approaching it. What we're seeing in the market is really um, there is an impact from the capital markets and the A and D market being a bit uh, closed in certain circumstances, and natural gas prices and NGL prices are, are lower uh, right now. Um, so that is causing some some issues for certain credits, um, but again, we're continue to be 78% EMP, first lien secured deals. Um, from a gas um, price perspective, 95% of our customers have some form of hedging. Like, you know, we don't really look at it on a, a, a portfolio basis, but we are pleased that we've seen our customer base pursue hedging as, as a way of protecting their downside risk. 
uh, you know, as it relates to specific credits, um, you know, we kind of monitor those on an individual basis and, and uh, don't really get too detailed about what's going on on particular deals. Um, and we'll, I can tell you that, you know, we feel very strongly that our workout team is, in certain er circumstances, is, is taking all steps necessary to, to minimize whatever exposure we have and uh, um, minimize the amount of loss such that we really feel like going forward in, in 2020, um, we will continue to have, um, you know, a 12-month loss in the 25 base, 20 to 25 basis points, which is consistent with what we've had in the past. Uh, maybe a little lumpy in the first quarter, but um, going forward, we don't see it getting uh, out of whack with what we've had historically. Okay. Thanks for taking my questions. Mm -hmm. Our next questions come from the line of Peter Winter of Wedbush Security. Please proceed with your question. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you talk about some of the drivers to the uh, three to four percent average loan growth? Because especially with um, energy, which was the main driver for 2019, is going to slow, and just general middle market, uh, a little bit of cautious, caution there. This is Stacy Peter. Uh, certainly, energy will continue to be a driver for us. Uh, I certainly don't want to indicate that it's going to not grow next year. We think there's going to be opportunity there. We grew 11%. I don't think we'll grow 11, but I think we can grow mid to high single digits inside of energy, which is obviously a large portfolio for us. We have ample room under our commercial real estate limits to continue to grow there. Uh, our teams there are continuing to see opportunities that uh, we think are, are positive and, and reasonable from a credit risk to take at this point in the cycle. Uh, so we think we'll see growth there. Healthcare has been an area that we've continued to grow and invest in. And we're see, you see that good growth for the year in healthcare. We have high expectations for that team in 2020. And we think we'll continue to grow there. Uh, where some of the softness is, is maybe on the, the lower end of CNI, where you may have a, a sole proprietor or a single business owner who uh, is, is kind of a little bit more cautious about the macro environment. But we think that clearly, uh, if you think about what we've done on the wealth side, we grew uh, our lending side in the, in the wealth space, you know, strong double digits last year, and we think that will be a growth driver for us in 2020 as well. So as you kind of add the pieces together and roll that forward into 2020, we certainly feel very confident that something in the 3 to 4% range is very achievable for us. Okay. And on the fee income side, you talked about brokerage and trading and, and wealth. I'm just wondering, can you talk a little bit, Stephen, about the uh, outlook for mortgage banking in 2020? Yeah, so I think um, we, we have good origination capability across our footprint. Uh, we feel very confident with the purchase market there and our ability to serve that market. And so I do think it'll be a little lower in total for the year of 2020, uh, but I think we've got a, a great approach and a good process, and we're pricing pretty well. We've got good discipline there, and uh, so I feel confident that we can um, achieve some pretty good results in mortgage. It may not be at the same revenue level that we achieved in, in 2019, given the different you know rate environment, but I, I do feel pretty good about the continued growth in that in that sector. Okay. And then just my last question, uh, I know you guys have done a lot of work on reducing uh, expenses at, at the bank. I'm just wondering, you know, with a tougher revenue environment, um, are there still opportunities to uh, cut expenses um, at the bank? Yeah, Peter, this is Steve. This, we actually really worked in earnest on, uh, on that uh, initiative really going back into the fall when it became apparent that we were going to see further rate cuts and have more pressure on the net interest revenue side in 20. You saw us uh, take a little over $2 million in uh, severance costs in the fourth quarter, uh, and that was really just identifying where we thought we had some opportunities across the board. Uh, we're also curtailing some of the, uh, the expansion of new positions across the bank as well. Uh, so we'll, there's always opportunities, and we're always uh, seeking an opportunity to improve efficiency. Uh, we're being careful not to do that on the backs of, of reducing 
uh, our investment commitment from a technology perspective. That's important to us competitively, uh, and we continue to, to make strides there. But no question, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have a hyper focus on expenses really throughout 2020. Okay. Thanks for taking my questions. Our next questions come from the line of Gary Tenner of DA Davidson. Please proceed with your question. Thanks. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Um, morning. Hey, uh, so I had two, two questions. One on the deposit side, you gave, obviously, Stephen, the um, sequential quarter change in deposit costs. Could you give us any intra-quarter color uh, in terms of deposit costs, maybe where they uh, you know, were in December? No, I mean, I don't have that in front of me exactly what they are in December. I just know, you know, the composite uh, deposit cost for the quarter. Uh, as Stacy mentioned earlier, we were we were happy to see that go down from 117 to 109. Uh, as he mentioned, I think there's opportunity there to continue to drive that down a bit. And um, But, you know, beyond that, that's, I probably wouldn't comment further. Okay. And then broader... Uh, perspective on the Oklahoma economy, uh, you know, we're hearing, uh, you know, that maybe there's a bit of a slowdown there, lower lower tax receipts. Uh, there's been some job cuts, I think, at some of the larger energy companies in the state. Can you talk about kind of the perspective for the, you know, broader Oklahoma economy? Oklahoma is doing well. I think the, the decline in tax receipts is largely driven by declines in gross production taxes, as there's been less drilling in uh, the scoop and the stack here in Oklahoma. But kind of corporate taxes and, and uh, personal income taxes have held in very very well and are actually slightly up a little bit. So I think that the Oklahoma economy is doing well. Uh, we don't see any weakness. Uh, really, the, the job cuts seem to be being uh, able to be absorbed by the economy in a reasonable period of time. So we're, we're not seeing kind of inherent weakness there, uh, understanding that, that there is uh, some dislocation from time to time with certain companies, but there's there's job growth here too that's able to absorb that, and uh, states doing well. All right, thank you. Thank you. Our next questions come from the line of Matt Olney of Stephen Zink. Please proceed with your questions. Hey, thanks. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Matt. I want to go back to, uh, I think it was Peter's first question on loan growth drivers in 2020. And Stacey, it sounds like energy will be a, a, a decent part of the driver. And I, I think energy is now around 18% of loans outstanding. Can you just r remind us what your internal limits are on, on this asset class? And, and with the higher charge-offs that we saw this quarter from energy, is there any pause or concern about growing this book in the future? Thanks. Sure. Uh, we have ample room inside of our concentration limits. We don't see anything that would be a constraint on our ability to grow it other than the opportunity to find good deals. If you look at you know, actual net charge-offs, we've been in this 10 to $12 million per quarter now for a while. I don't see the fourth quarter as an anomaly from that perspective. I think it's very consistent. Actually, if you go back and look at the fourth quarter last year, I think net charge offs fourth quarter over fourth quarter are almost identical. So uh, we're, we're, as Mark alluded to, we're kind of providing some guidance that we think net charge offs will be in that you know 20 to 25 basis point range next year for the full calendar year. There could be some of that that's front loaded earlier in the year as some of these near term issues work themselves through the process. But we still feel very good about this space. You talk about net charge offs in energy this year, they were higher than last year. Uh, they're at about you know, 91 basis points or so uh, in the EMP space. But if you think about the sector overall, we're getting 100 to 125 basis points additional spread uh, on those loans. We think we'll continue to see some opportunity to improve that in 2020 as others think about their exposure here. Uh, but we, we like this business through the cycle. We understand that this has been a longer term uh, uh, ebb and flow in this industry than we've seen in a while. But we have a great team. Uh, the credit teams and the line are working great together. We have a great engineering staff. Uh, we think that we're well positioned to be able to manage through this and, and do it in a way that is good for the shareholders uh, and good for us. I think we've talked about there will be some lumpiness and criticized and classified and non-accruals. 
uh, and you see that a little bit, but even even with all that, our non-accrual loans are less at the end of the fourth quarter than they were at the end of the second quarter. So there's a little bit where we're going to go up, there's a little bit where we're going to go down, but it will ebb and flow, and it's at a level that we believe is very manageable. And you know, for the full year, we're going to have 21 basis points in that charge-offs uh, for the company. We think that's going to compare very favorably to our peer group. And so uh, it, it's an asset class that clearly is in the media a lot. There is uh, issues with around liquidity in the space to a large extent, but we're working through that and think we're very well positioned to manage that. We're still as, uh, as energized, if you will, around energy as we ever have been because we think that it's, it's an important part of our uh, DNA as a company, uh, and, and we continue to want to emphasize that uh, as a core product offering for BOK Financial. Okay, thanks for that color, Stacy. And then sticking on on the credit discussion, the press release mentioned that non accrual loans did tick up, and I think it was pointed to a seven million dollar increase uh, from the multifamily community development credit. Can you tell us more about this credit, and is that is that part of the senior housing portfolio? It is not a part of the senior housing portfolio. This is a a low income housing tax credit. Uh, deal that we made as part of our uh, investment in the communities that we serve. Uh, it has demonstrated some weakness in the sense that it's been slower to lease up, but uh, leasing is commencing. It's just moving at a slower pace. We don't foresee any real significant loss. Uh, I won't say zero loss, but certainly not any that's significant related to that new non-accrual loan uh, in the fourth quarter. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Our next set of questions come from the line of John Arfstrom of RBC Capital Markets. Please proceed with your questions. Thanks. Good morning, all. Good morning. A um, few follow-ups. Uh, Stephen, maybe for you, early on when you talked about the NIM, uh, you said it, it, it was the full realization of the last two cuts. We talked a little bit about deposit pricing, but I'm just curious, are you saying that you feel like the earning asset yield pressure that we saw last quarter is essentially – run its course? Is that the message that you're sending? I think a good portion of it is, yeah. Um, when you think about the, the number of, the percentage of LIBOR-based loans that we have, they've repriced effectively. And so I think the majority of that is is uh, in the numbers. Okay, good. Um, and then, um, Stacy or Steve, maybe for you, uh, this general slowdown in CNI that you talked about, and, and I think you used the term pause, and maybe it's a confidence issue. Obviously, three months ago, it was maybe a little bit more pessimistic, and things are a little more optimistic today. Have you seen any of that pause or confidence uh, improve a bit in the last three months, or is it just more of the same? I think the environment on the, the middle market and lower end middle market CNI side has been relatively consistent over the last few months. Uh, I think as we begin to get more certainty around some of these things, I think you'll see uh, continued opportunities for people to invest in their business, buy a new piece of equipment, add a line, grow and expand the business. But today, that's not been an area that we've seen a lot of growth in, uh, certainly outpacing GDP growth. You know, we've talked uh, for many years about kind of being able to outpace GDP growth. You can do it a little bit, but not a much and not consistently. And if you do, then, you know, be careful. And so I think that's kind of what we're seeing is just kind of slow, steady growth, not, you know, high single-digit kind of growth in that space. Okay. Good. Um, talked about two large year-end expected paydowns. Can you give us an idea of the size of those? How material they uh, have? No, we didn't have – we had paydowns broadly in both uh, – in really three areas, in energy and commercial real estate and in our wholesale retail sector. Uh, just – Portfolio paydowns. They weren't large credits. Uh, they, you know, some of that cyclicality. One of those in the wholesale retail sector tends to fund up in the summer uh, as they go through the kind of Christmas selling season, and they they buy inventory and they tend to sell down as cash flow comes in during that period of time. Energy and, and commercial real estate were, you know, just kind of the nature of the business. Nothing unusual there, particularly. But as I look at the early part of 2020, I see a nice rebound. There and so uh, I'm certainly op uh, optimistic as we move into 2020 that, that that was not a trend but just kind of a late fourth quarter anomaly. Sometimes you see those kinds of things, John. I don't know if it's 
you know, balance sheet dressing at the, you know, for some of those companies or not, window dressing. But we'll see that and, and uh, tend not to react to that uh, real strongly based on what we see late in the fourth quarter uh, as we move forward. Okay. All right. I may have, may have misread you on that, but that helps. And then last one, um, it sounds like you still you have quite a bit of room in commercial real estate, but you mentioned concentration limits a couple of times. Can you just remind us of the themes and kind of the guardrails on that? So, you know, commercial real estate's 100. It's based on both of our limits in energy and uh, commercial real estate are based on committed, not outstanding. They're 175% of Tier 1 capital and reserves for commercial real estate. I think it's 225% of Tier 1 capital and reserves for energy. But we, we've got ample room to grow uh, consistent with the guidance that we provided in both those spaces. So we're not, we don't have any overriding concerns that our internal concentration guidelines will be a constraint for growth in those areas in a meaningful way in 2020. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Our final questions come from the line of Jared Shaw of Wells Fargo Securities. Please proceed with your questions. Hi, good morning. This is actually Timor Braziller filling in for Jared. First okay. question, I just want to circle back to some of the commentary on energy. I'm wondering if some of the, the, the weakness in the energy market is, is manifesting itself in other industries, and, and if so, uh, how much of that is driving the commentary around the sluggishness in, in middle market CNI? You're talking just a broader spillover effect of the broader kind of Colorado, Texas, and Oklahoma economy. I, I, sure. You know, it, it's a it's a natural conclusion to see that and, and wonder about that. It's not obvious to me at this stage that that's what we're seeing. If you think about, really, from my perspective, this is the kind of the tale of this original downturn that happened in, uh, you know, 2015-16. I don't. I think it was more pronounced in that period of time. I think where we are today, it's not nearly as pronounced, and it's a little bit more steady state from that perspective. I'm not necessarily, you know, it's a good question, but I'm not necessarily seeing a direct tie at this point to the slowdown uh, in general CNI to the you know weakness, uh, this, some weakness that's being demonstrated in energy. I think that was more obvious and pronounced, you know, several years ago. Uh, but as we've stabilized in this kind of $55 to $60 price for oil, particularly in our, our footprint markets, I think that uh, uh, that's less of an issue. Okay, and then maybe switching gears to the deposit growth this quarter, uh, pretty impressive. Was that just the culmination of the work that's been going on um, that kind of all hit in the fourth quarter? And I guess uh, looking at some of the initiatives that have been taking place, what's still remaining and how should we think about uh, deposit growth heading into 2020? So you know, deposit growth is something that Steve laid out for us as an important initiative to kind of try to grow deposits to fund the loan growth in 2019. And as you, as you go through that process, it's a hard, it's a shift that doesn't turn immediately. It takes a lot of time and effort to begin to cultivate and identify the opportunities if you look in the fourth quarter, uh, Scott Grower and our wealth team really did an exceptional job of bringing in uh, great uh, deposits uh, priced at, at, at reasonable levels. Uh, they were a big driver for uh, the deposit growth in the fourth quarter, but the commercial businesses did a great job with that as well. Uh, really just as a result of the, a long-term effort, kind of the culmination of a, an effort that's been going on for a while in terms of moving the deposit needle. As we think about 2020, I think our, our really desire is kind of growth at a reasonable price. We want to grow uh, to continue to fund the loan growth, but we're very mindful of uh, ensuring that we're uh, paying attention to the cost of those deposits and doing everything we can to uh, uh, m minimize uh, the impact to our net interest margin as we think about growing deposits in 2020. Okay, and then just last one for me, looking at mortgage banking revenue versus expense and the disconnect there this quarter, is that a timing issue or was that a, a true up on incentive for the strong year? And uh, if Yeah, you know, the, the, biggest, the biggest driver of the revenue side is uh, commitment levels, and then the expense side is really tied more to loan fundings. And so if you look at loan fundings, they're pretty level, and so the work – 
uh, that had to take place to get loan fundings completed uh, in the mortgage banking cost line item is there, but the revenue side is is more um, influenced by the commitment levels at the end of the year, which did drop off. So that's kind of the disconnect, it's timing. Great, thank you. We have reached the end of the question and answer session. I will now turn the call back over to Stephen now for any closing remarks. Okay, well thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. We appreciate all your questions and interest in BOK Financial. And if you have any further questions, uh, give me a call at 918-595-3030 or you can email us at ir at bokf.com. Have a great day. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation and have a great day.